We are on the air in five, four, three, two. Tonight, WBFR Playhouse of the Air and our sponsors present a trio of stories of suspense and mystery entitled Vintage Hitchcock. Each week at this hour, we invade your living rooms, providing your radio holds up, and bring you exciting stories of the strange and unusual. Dark, compelling yarns cold from the four corners of the world, bringing murder back into the home where it belongs. Tonight, we present three tales immortalized on celluloid by the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. The Larger. <coughs> Sabotage. <coughs> and the 39 Steps. <coughs> Tonight's first play is a sweet, homey little story of intrigue, suspicion, and murder. The cast is a rather small one and threatens to get smaller with every passing moment. <laughs> the play is entitled The Lodger and takes place in London in 1888. The newspaper headlines scream of a killer on the loose going by the name of the Avenger, whose fifth victim had just been discovered. As our story begins, we meet Ellen Bunting and her husband Robert, a couple with rooms to let in their modest home in the Whitechapel district. And now, The Lodger. Him. You know, he could be the person standing next to you. Or maybe the man you bump into. To tell the thought. Yes, if only the police had something to go on. It looks like the adventure is just too quick for them. But look here, it says the girl he got last night was like all the others. Pretty, blonde, and she had just come from the music hall. Exactly like the rest of the victims. And let's see, described by her friends as a very light-hearted girl. What a pity. Ellen, did you ever stop to think who fits that to a T? In fact, fits all those girls' descriptions perfectly. Our own Daisy. Oh, that's a pretty thought, Robert. Well, maybe it's a good thing that she's not. Well, she's with her aunt instead of here. London is no place for any girl right now. Just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it would be to have her here with us. Well, there's no sense in even talking about it. We just can't afford it. Well, I know that, Ellen, but I hope we can manage it some way. How? Haven't I scraped myself half crazy trying to keep us going? But you don't care about that, do you? No. Your daisy's far more man than I am. Now, Ellen, that don't sound like you. Well, I can't help it if it don't. What are we going to do? We'll get along, dear. Something will turn up. We haven't done a larger for months. Nobody even comes to look at the room anymore. Things will work out, my love. Oh, they ain't never going to work out. Soon enough, we won't even have a roof over our heads. Oh, I'm sorry, Robert. I didn't mean to go on so. Oh, I know you didn't, dear. It's all right. I didn't think. It's just that I've been so worried. Uh, don't you go wearing another second, old girl. Why, first thing you know, you won't be pretty anymore. You had your face all wrinkled. Oh, now your... see here. <laughs> Come on, let's see a smile. Let's see a smile. Let me alone. <laughs> Who do you suppose that could be? Awful late for visitors. Robert, do you think it should be somebody looking for a room? Well, it might be. Oh, I wish it were. Then you could have your daisy back. Want me to go to the door? No, I'll go. You just stay here. Well, all right. I'll be sure you get a good look at him before you let him in, dear. Oh, I'm coming. I saw your sign. It says you have a room for rent. Oh, yes! Yes, sir! Uh, please, won't you come in? Thank you. It's a horrid night out there, isn't it? Coming down in sheets. Might I take your cape, sir? No, thank you. Now, I'm looking for a quiet room. It must be very quiet. 
Oh, we have that, sir. Just that. Above all, our house is quiet. Excellent. Your bag, sir. May I take it? I'll hold it. Do you have any other bags? Just the one. Now, if you'd be so good as to show me the room, please. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. It's right up the stairs this way. Thank you. You see, sir, there's just my husband and me here, and we're ever so quiet. I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking, sir. Here we are. Now, I'll just light the gas. There we are. Very good. I think I like this room. <coughs> yes, it is pleasant, isn't it? And there aren't many <coughs> rooms with such pretty pictures, are there now? We've had them in our family for years, sir. Yeah, pretty pictures interest me very little. But what does impress me about this room is the very simplicity of it. The bareness. Yes, sir. It's not at all crowded, yes. It would be quite suitable, Mrs... Bunting, sir. Mrs. Bunting, you see, I do a great deal of studying in my book here. The Holy Bible. Oh, yes, sir. And please, let me help you with your bag. No, don't touch it. Oh, well, I only wish to help. Forgive me, Mrs. Bunting. It's just that, well, it's just I'm quite weary. I'm very tired. I've been doing a lot of studying. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, sir. He bringeth them to their desired haven. Beautiful words, Mrs. Bunting. Indeed they are, sir. And now at last I have found my haven of rest. Oh, yes, sir. Then you'll be taking the room. Let us see now. What are you going to charge me? I shall be staying in most of the time, and I shall be wanting meals. Oh, we can see to that, sir. Now, Mrs. Bunting, if I pay you 42 shillings a week, is that satisfactory? Oh, why, yes! Sir, that will be quite all right. Good, and I shall pay you several weeks in advance. My name is Sleuth. Mr. Sleuth? S-L-E-U-T-H. Think of the hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. And here, here are your 42 shillings. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. And I think I shall enjoy a light supper now, Mrs. Bunting. Just... Bread and butter, perhaps. Could you arrange that? Certainly, sir. I'll do that now. And if you're requiring any beer or spirits... Oh, certainly not. Uh, sir, what did I say? I thought you understood me, Mrs. Bunting. And I had hoped you and your husband were abstainers. But we are, sir. We don't keep nothing about. I would have had to go out and find something for you. Oh, Oh, of course. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bunting. I don't wish you to think me rude. You've been so kind and considerate. I hope I know a gentleman when I see one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'll just hurry along and get your supper. Please stop that, do you hear? Oh, sir, what did I do? You were humming that music. Oh, but sir. Music is an instrument of sin. Oh, yes, sir. And you did tell me, Mrs. Bunting, that your house would be absolutely quiet. Oh, but it is, sir. I didn't mean any harm. Believe me. I believe you. I'm sorry I spoke so sharply. I know you're trying to be considerate and kind. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> shilling a week? Yes, in advance. No, Ellen, it's wonderful. Do you realise what this means? We can have Daisy back. Yes, I know. Here, Robert, warm that teapot and put some tea leaves in it. Right, sir. We can have her back with us tomorrow. You know something, old girl? When a guy not going to worry too much about Daisy falling free to that adventure fellow. Whatever do you mean, Robert? Well, she's not a girl who takes a drink, you know. And what's that to do with it, please? Oh, something I read in the paper while you're upstairs with the gentleman. He just found out every one of the Avengers' victims had been drinking. They figure he must be some kind of rabid abstainer. <laughs> what a peculiar chap. What's that sound? Oh, that's Mr. Sleuth. He has a limp and uses a cane. Why is he pacing around like that? Never mind that now. Hurry, Robert. Put the butter on the tray. Hurry with it. Yes, no. 
How's the tea? I, I suppose it's all in order. Open the door, Robert, and I'll, I'll take it right up to him. Right there away. Go. There you go, Go. First thing in the morning, I'm gonna fetch Daisy and bring her home. Oh, it's a wonderful thing, and it's wonderful. Hurry up with the supper, old girl. <laughs> Let not thy mind be drawn away in her ways, neither be thou deceived with her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, and the strongest have been slain by her! Mr. Sleuth? Ah, Mrs. Budding! <coughs> you will please knock before entering in the future, Mrs. Budding. Sir, oh sir, you're trying. I'll tidy it up for you straight away and put another kettle on. That won't be necessary. I've decided to go for a walk. It's a pleasant night for one. Tonight? Well, very well, Mr. Smooth. I'll have this all tidied up by the time you return. Very well. Oh, what? Mr. Smooth? Yes, what is it? Those pictures. Those pretty girls. You've turned all your faces to the wall. Yes, I've turned them all to the wall because they're wicked and sinful. Oh, but sir, I... Don't you agree, Mrs. Bunting, that everything wicked and sinful should be purged from the earth? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Oh, I'm very glad to hear that, Mrs. Bunting. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must go. Good night, Mrs. Bunting. stairs and walked to the window to watch as Mr. Sleuth moved off down the street, his single bag in hand and black cape swirling about him. Finally, he was lost in the fog. She stared after him a long while before doing the dishes and retiring for the evening. And a restless night she had, almost dawn before she had convinced herself that Mr. Sleuth was a trifle old and paying 42 shillings. Maybe he had a right to his strange ways. It was daylight when she was suddenly awoken by the shouting of the newsboys. Oh, murder! Read all about it! Murder at King's Cross last night! Avenger strikes again! Helen was a little frightened to meet with our lodger the next morning. She couldn't quite understand her uneasiness in his presence. The lodger's sudden appearance promised to save their household. But where did he go at night, disappearing into the London fog? Since Mr. Bunting had gone to meet Daisy, Mr. Sleuth ate breakfast alone. Ellen watched him through the crack in the door. Finally, she went in with more tea. More tea, Mr. Sleuth? Thank you, Mrs. Bunting, but I don't care for any more tea. You're very kind, but I must go on with my work now. You'll excuse me. Her fear really changed to pity then. He was so helpless and tired. He was so considerate. Why was she so uneasy? It must be all the talk of the Avenger and those horrible murders on everyone's lips. This man couldn't be a murderer. It was all a coincidence. Besides, she just couldn't afford to lose those 42 shillings a week. Around 10 in the morning, Mr. Sleuth left the house and Ellen decided to go upstairs and have a look about his room. She had to find out what he carried in that one piece of luggage. It wasn't a bag, no, it was more like a case. Yes, a case. For a knife! No, 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 no. <laughs> Ellen rushed up the stairs, her heart beating wildly at the thought she had in the case. No, there wasn't anything in his closet. She moved over to the chest of drawers against the wall. Nothing in the top one. In the next, there were just some socks and underclothes. The next one was empty. There was only one other place for the small, narrow case. The bottom drawer! And it was locked! She pulled and pulled at it, and suddenly, she heard the front door open downstairs! Oh, you're upstairs, Ellen. Daisy's here! Good heavens! Oh, Mother, it's so good to see you. It's so good to be home. Why, what happens the matter? Yes, you're quite white, Ellen. Oh, it's well. I'm all right, I'm all right. It's just that I wasn't expecting you so soon. Baby. It's good to be back, Mother. The country's all right, but there's nothing like London now, is there? Oh, 
No, there isn't. Well, as long as that adventure's about, you're gonna have to keep this young lady indoors, London or no London. And we're gonna have to do something about these blonde locks. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll die him, maybe. Oh, well. Daisy, I might as well get you set up. <laughs> you see, Father, what did I tell you? She'll have a dust cloth in my hands before I have my coat off. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sloop! What are you all doing in my room? Oh, we were just leaving, sir. I require privacy in this is bunting. I thought I had made that clear. You did, Mr. Sleuth, you did. From now on, Mrs. Bunting, I shall keep my room locked. Uh, but you see, sir, I was just tidying up a bit, and Mr. Bunting, he brought our daughter home. She just arrived. This is Daisy. I'm pleased to meet you, sir. She's been away for quite a long while. You see, Mrs. Sleuth, and we've all been a bit excited, you might say. Yes. You're quite surprised to hear us laughing and carrying on. Yes, yes, I must say I was. But then there are different kinds of joy, are there not, Daisy? Yes, yes, I'm sure there are. Yes, there's the despicable, evil joy of the abandoned. And then there's the divine joy and happiness of the blessed. A vast difference that you understand that, don't you, Daisy? Why, yes, Mr. Sleuth. Oh, I'm, I certainly hope so, Daisy. Nowadays, there are so very few young women like yourself who do. Why, Mr. Sleuth, you mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have any fun? Enjoyment and fun, my child, are the devil's breeding ground. All his implements are there. Pleasure and impropriety, the temptation of music and dancing. Oh, there's nothing I like better than dancing, and if I you, thought... You like to dance. Oh, she doesn't know what she's saying, Mr. Sleuth. She's just a child. Daisy, you not know you've never been one for dancing. You never learned how. But I did learn, Mother, while I was away. What's so wrong about it? What's the harm in dancing? It says she lies in wait for a prey and increases the transgressions among men. I don't know what you mean. I've never heard such poppycock. Poppycock. You call the scripture poppycock. Daisy! Daisy, go to your room! It's all right, Mrs. Bunting, it's all right. I'm used to that kind of talk. Good day. <laughs> he is a queer one, all right, but such a gentleman, too. It's because of the rent Mr. Suit is paying that we're able to have your own, my Daisy. Well, in that case, I suppose not so bad after all. But he is. What? Ellen! Daisy, I do not want you to be alone with Mr. Sleuth. Will you promise me that, Daisy? But why should I make such a promise? What's come over you, Ellen? Nothing. My nerves, I would imagine. Perhaps I'll go out for a while and get some air. <sighs> for a moment, Ellen was about to tell Daisy and Robert of her awful suspicions. But she stopped. They were only suspicions. At the same time, she had a thought. She'd go to the coroner's inquest they were having for the Avengers' latest victim, hoping to hear something said that would clear her of her suspicions of the lodger. At least she would give him this last chance. A lady was testifying as Ellen took her seat. The witness had seen the Avenger from her window, she said, and her description of him didn't tally with Mr. Sleuth at all. I can't tell you how relieved Ellen was until it was pointed out that the witness couldn't possibly have seen the Avenger from that, from her window that night because of the fog. <laughs> the next witness was a Mr. Cannot. Ellen leaned forward anxiously as they swore him in and began asking questions. You say, Mr. Cannot, you are positive that you saw this man? Positive, sir. It was only a few moments before the murder that I saw the Avenger. Describe him. Well, he wore a black cape and he was very gaunt looking. He walked with a bit of a limp and carried a cane. Oh, and he was carrying a small handbag. A handbag? Oh, yes, sir. A small, narrow handbag. Such a one as might contain a knife. No, 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 no. Order, please. Silence in the court. Proceed, Mr. Cannot. Well, he seemed an educated man, I judge, but quite mad. What do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. It sounded as if he was reciting scriptures from the Bible. 
There was no doubt about it now. Ellen was certain that Mr. Sleuth was the Avenger. She ran out of the courtroom as quickly as she could, running and walking somehow, as the nightmare of terror grew bigger and bigger inside of her. She was three streets from her home when she saw her husband, Robert. One thought hit her clearly. She realized Daisy must be home alone with the Avenger! Robert! Robert! Ellen, what is it? Robert, where's Daisy? Why, she's at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. Whatever is she doing there? The lodger. He, Mr. Sue took her there. What? Our lodger? He's the <coughs> Avenger! Whatever are you saying? Listen, Robert, listen. Mr. Sleuth is the Avenger. I'm 100% certain of it. Did I let Daisy go with them? Oh, hurry, Robert, hurry. To Madame Tussauds, we've no time to spare. Racing as they never before, Ellie and Robert ran through the town toward Madame Tussauds. They searched madly through the museum until there was only one place left to look. The Chamber of Horrors! Now listen, it says here that these are actual death masks of some of England's most notorious killers. Mm, I'm afraid I find this section of the museum all a bit too ghoulish for my taste. Uh, suppose we return to the Last Supper again. Oh, come now. Don't you like a nice fright every now and then? Do I frighten you, Daisy? Daisy! Daisy! Daisy, where are you? Why, that's Mother and Father. I'm in here! Daisy! Where is he? Who, Mother? Where's Mr. Sleuth? Why, I'm not sure where he's gone. He was right here. Oh, Mr. Sleuth! No, stop! Daisy! He's the Avenger! What? Mr. Sleuth is the Avenger! Over the weeks that followed, the Avenger murders seemed to stop, and the Buntings never saw Mr. Sleuth again. He had vanished as suddenly as he had arrived. Each night as she prepared for bed, Ellen found herself haunted by the thoughts of him. Ready for bed, my dear? Yes, Robert. Good night, my love. Good night. Sweet dreams, my pet. You too. Robert? Yes? Where's Daisy? She wanted to get a mind off things. She's at the music hall. Well, I suppose there's safety in numbers. Right, Robert? How many? One, please. How many? One. Avenger strikes again! Avenger kills blonde at music hall! That was a warm and very touching fable, now wasn't it? <laughs> Naturally, the Avenger was eventually caught, indicted, tried, convicted, sentenced, and paid his debt to society. Although this didn't put an end to the occasional newspaper headline announcing yet another murder of another young blonde woman. But in the case of the larger, crime does not pay. Not even on radio. You must have a sponsor. Here's ours! Air travel has come a long way since passengers crouched in open cockpits bundled to the eyes. Now comfort makes its greatest advance in the history of flight. Imagine an airplane so perfectly air-conditioned that even the faintest trace of tobacco smoke is filtered through the atmosphere that you breathe. Gracious stewardesses serve you cocktails and champagne dinners aloft, and pilots with years of experience in the friendly skies guide you smoothly to destinations just hours away. Mount Rushmore, the Statue of Liberty, and San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, just to name a few. Our North by Northwest Airlines, the world leader <laughs> in air travel, first class is the only service we offer. So, come fly with North by Northwest and get a real picture of how wonderful air travel can be. Oh, no.
Northwest Airline ticket offices or see your travel agent today! When it's time for a bump in the way, fly north, fly north, That was beautifully put. <laughs> there are other kinds of darkness in London besides the fog in the night. And the heart of this part of the city is the darkest of all, the darkness found in Bijou Cinema. The flickering shop lights illuminate the hustle and bustle of the city, and sometimes they go out. <laughs> Something's in the air tonight, however, and the crowds of people aren't so much afraid of the dark, but are having a laugh instead. <laughs> Folks joke on the underground, and the mood becomes light. <laughs> Electric Light and Power Company. Why all this whole city is in the dark now? We're working on it now, so I assure you. Electric Light and Power Company. Light Light's out. Power it's out. Power down. Turbine stopped. What's that? Sand. Sabotage. Sabotage. What's at the back of it? Who did it? Carl Anton Verlock is on his way home from an errand of sorts. I should perhaps explain that home is a modest flat over a cinema he runs with his wife, an American named Winnie. <laughs> and the errand? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's just say that when he returns home, the first thing he will do is wash the sand from his hands. And now, sabotage! <laughs> We're in front of Burlock's Bijou Cinema now, at the box office, where a crowd of patrons demand their money back. I know how the law stands. Yes. You broke the contract, therefore you broke the law. But the blackout's everywhere. Just look up and down the street. I pay my money to look at the pictures. If I want to see the dark, I can do it at home. Yes, free of charge. Oh, I can stay at home and listen to the radio. Oh, who does that anymore? Oh, who would want to do that? I think it's a blinking shame robbing the good people like that. Ted, what are you doing here? Just thought I'd lend a hand in your all of need, Mrs. V. That won't be necessary. You can go back to your green grocery stand, Ted. I've got things under control. Very well. But if you need me, all you want to do is whistle. That's awfully kind, Mrs. Ted. I'll have to remember that. Oh, we've got to have our money back. It's an act of providence, like an earthquake or a thunderbolt. Or a baby. Ted, would you kindly not to interfere? We've got to have our money back. Step aside and let a girl get to work. Will you? I'm sorry, I'm so late, Mrs. Oh, Renee, are you a sight for sore eyes? You are nearly blind ones. I had a hell of a time trying to eat my egg on toast and dust. Top of it's in my ear now. The patrons want their money back, Renee, but we can't afford this. I do wish Mr. Verloc would come. Rotten place, can't even see the pictures. Listen to them, Renee, they're getting nasty. Nasty? Well, you leave it to me, Mrs. V. Thank you. Hand me that flashlight, Renee, would you please? I'm going to see if Mr. Verloc has returned. Don't be long, but I won't. With the flashlight leading her on, Winnie makes her way through the dark cinema and into the living quarter she shares with her husband and younger brother Stevie. When she reaches her bedroom, she finds that somebody's been sleeping in her bed, and he's still there! <gasps> Have no fear, it is only her husband. <laughs> Carl, when did you get home? I haven't been out. We weren't in 20 minutes ago when I called for you. Oh, I was asleep. Why are you showing, shining the torch and can't you switch on the light or something? You can't, it failed. What, the view is going down? No, it's everything. In the streets, in the trains, and the audience downstairs wants their money back. They're making a terrible row about it. Well, give it back. What? We can't possibly afford to do that. Yes, we can. You must be crazy, Carl. It'll clear us right out. You're always saying we can't cover expenses. That's all right. It doesn't pay to antagonize the public. I've got some money coming in. Go on. Well, it's your decision. But if we're going to be generous, let's do it properly. Come out to the box office with me and make an official announcement. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not worth all that fuss. Uh, they're used to you winning. You make the speech. <laughs> well, all right. But I still think you're crazy. <laughs> Returning to the box office, Winnie finds Ted commanding the crowd's attention. It's an act of God, I tell you. What do you call an act of God? Your face for one, and you won't get your money back on that one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think you're doing, Ted? Just lending a hand, Mrs. Verloc. But I asked you not to interfere. I've been delivering a little counterattack. Look, they're on the run. Well, they can come right back. 
Listen, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to get your money back. Don't, don't, don't give it so. now, Mrs. Werner. I'll stand by you. I prefer you to stand by your apple store. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been speaking with Mr. Verloc, and since you're all regular patrons and good friends, he's going to let you have your money back. There'll be no money back, I tell you. Go on, get off. Please don't pay any attention to him. I tell you, you're crazy. I had it all fixed. Will you mind your own business? Of all the obstinate people. If you don't go away, I'll call the police. <laughs> Renee, stop refunding the patrons their money. Oh, let's have the lights! And there was! Thank you for your trouble, Ted. I see you meant to Not at all. I like trouble, Mrs. B. <laughs> Business back to usual. Mrs. Jones, the Verloc's cook, stops by to see Winnie on her way out. The vegetables are all ready for dishing up, Mrs. Verloc. I've got to hurry home because my husband's husband's having trouble with his kidneys again. And I can't leave him for long. Your young brother's looking after them. What, the kidneys? No, the vegetables. Good night, Mrs. Jones. Oh, say to you, Mrs. Verloc. <laughs> In the kitchen, Winnie's younger brother Steenie helps prepare the dinner as best he can. Alas, he is better at making a mess than a meal. Oh no, I've done it again. Oh, Stevie, have you done all this by yourself? I tried. Oh, come on, don't be so modest. Sorry about the plate. That's all right. Now take off my apron and wash your hands for dinner. Winnie and Stevie bring the rest of the dinner to the table where Mr. Verloc is waiting. Well, Carl, we didn't have to pay the audience back their money after all. Ah, uh, always that woman, Mrs. Jones, manages to make the vegetables brown. I'm always telling you you like things green. I'll make you a salad. Stevie, run next door to Ted and get a nice big head of lettuce. Long or round? I like long best. Whichever's freshest, and tell Ted to charge it to our account. <laughs> we very nearly wouldn't have been able to afford lettuce if we paid the audience back. I don't see why you wanted to pay them back at all. And if you were quiet, I don't like attention being drawn to us in such a way. <laughs> Ted, what are you doing here? Good evening. Forgive me for butting in on your private affairs, but Stevie didn't appear to know whether he wanted long, round, square, or oblong lettuce. So I brought a selection. Oh, uh, good evening, Mr. Verloc. So you came home just in time to see the trouble, eh? Me? I've been in since the afternoon, but I could have sworn I saw you come in just at about an hour ago. Well, you're wrong. I didn't know anything about it until Winnie woke me. Did I, Winnie? No, Mr. Verloc was taking a nap when I found him. Sorry, my mistake, I suppose. Well, good night, all. Good night, Ted. As the Verlocs begin their dinner, we follow Ted back through the cinema and to the green brochure, where he has a word with his boss. Mind if I pop off early tonight, girl? Okay, Ted. Thank you. Good night. Ted takes the underground to Scotland Yard and goes to see Inspector Talbot, his real boss. You see, Ted is working undercover to keep an eye on Mr. Verloc. Ted fills Talbot in on the latest activities. I'm sure I saw Verloc return after the lights had gone out. But later, when I challenged him, he said he hadn't been out at all. His wife confirmed his story. Naturally. She would if she's in it. Same as being robbed in a crowd. One man treads on your toe. And while you're arguing with him, his pal picks your pocket. I don't think she or her little brother are mixed up in this thing. Can you prove that? Not yet. But it's the powers up the ladder that are a concern, aren't they? If Varnock's a puppet, who's pulling the strings? They're the people that you and I'll never catch. It's the men they employ that are all we're likely to get. You keep following Mr. Verloc, and don't be so quick as to rule out his wife or her brother yet either. Oling said at your disposal too. Let him shadow one, and you the other. Of course, sir. Very good. The next morning, Ted is at the Green Grocer when Mr. Verloc emerges from the cinema. Good morning, Mr. Verloc. Where are you up to this fine morning? I'm off to pick up a new film for the weekend. Well, pick us a good one, then. You know, with plenty of intrigue, suspense, and murders. This stuff, stuff makes me sick. The women like it, though. Good day to you, Ted. Ted watches Mr. Verloc cross the street. Colin Ted, another Scotland Yard detective, is standing across the street. Ted gives him the signal to follow Mr. Verloc, who boards a bus without realizing he's being followed. 
Come now, Stevie, we haven't all day. Why, if it isn't Stevie and Mrs. Varlock? Hi, Ted. How's your green grocer? Ripping and roaring. Always a market for greens and things and cabbages and kings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ted. Did you hear what he said, sister? Yes, Ted's a clever one, all right. Your fruits are our lunch today, Ted. Is that all? How about a nice juicy steak with me? What about it? I'm all for it. Good. Where shall we go? I like to go to Simpsons. My friend's uncle took him there once. Mind your manners, Stevie. Don't be too hard, Mrs. V. Let's make it Simpsons. I won't take no for an answer. Very well. Oh boy, Simpsons! Simpsons it is. Off we go. As Ted stops for Simpsons with Winnie and Stevie, Mr. Verloc has reached the zoo. There, Mr. Verloc meets with Vladimir, his boss. Calling Ted follows as close as he dares. Good morning, Vladimir. Good morning, Vladimir. I trust you were satisfied with my work last night. It was just a sort of thing to make people sit up. I think you'll agree I've earned my money. I hope you don't mind my asking for it in mouth notes. Obviously you've not seen today's newspapers, Sherlock, or you wouldn't be so proud of yourself. Look at this headline. London laughs at the blackout. When one sets out to put a fear of death into people, it's not helpful to make them laugh. We're not comedians. It's not my fault if you're such fools. Londoners are not fools. They laughed because what happened last night was laughable. They did the right to laugh this time. What do you mean? You'll be paid your money when you've earned it. I don't follow. My dear Verloc, I once read a sign in Piccadilly Circus calling it the center of the world. I think you'd better pay a visit there tomorrow and leave a small parcel in the cloakroom at the underground station. What sort of a parcel? A parcel of fireworks. Fireworks? No. I'm not interested in being connected with anything that means loss of life. You'll have to get somebody else. I won't touch it. Very well then, Verloc. If you think you're so well off. You know I'm not. All right then. And if you're so fussy about doing it yourself, surely you can find someone else to do it for you. Perhaps. There's an address on this little paper. Go and see this man. He's a very nice old gentleman and he makes lovely fireworks. I'll try and see him. And don't forget tomorrow. Busy day in Piccadilly Circus. Lots of people enjoying themselves. Unaware. Feeling safe and secure. Oh, you want me to come and report? Thanks. No! If you're successful, it won't be necessary. Tomorrow, they must not let. Ted, Winnie, and Stevie arriving at Simpson's Restaurant, one of the finest in all of London. Have you ever been here at Simpson's before, Ted? No, never. Well, this is very expensive, isn't it? Yes, it looks like it, doesn't it? Got a pound's note if you want it. It's all right. Now, Stevie, setting aside the steak for a moment, we have here before us oysters, caviar, smoked salmon, fried, grilled, or boiled sole, roast saddle of mutton, ketchup chicken pudding, boiled silver side. I think Stevie like a nice poached egg on toast, and I'll have a mixed salad. What? Poached egg here at Simpsons? Why, that's enough to make the roast beef turn in its scrape. Waiter! May I take your order, sir? Sir, loin for three, please. Very good, sir. Right away. When did you come over from America, Mrs. Verloc? About a year ago. Business wasn't too good over there. That's funny. People used to go to the States because business wasn't too good over here. How are things here now? Not too good? Not terribly. I hadn't noticed you turning people away. It's hard to make a one-man business pay these days. Unless you want a sideline. Is Mr. Verloc a sideline? No, but we're quite satisfied with things as they are. Just one happy little family. Just one happy little family. Mr. Verloc's... Very kind to Stevie. And that means a lot to Stevie's sister. It means everything. Now here we are. No fun for you as usual, sir? You haven't been in for a long time, but I don't forget. Do I look as though I don't like facts? That's the big idea. What idea? You said you'd never been here before. That waiter obviously knew you. Come to think of it, there's a mystery about most people. What goes on in that cinema of yours after hours? Deeds of darkness. Does your husband go on mysterious journeys? He does, wearing false whiskers. Aha! Uh -huh. That means there's another woman in his life. <laughs> if only you knew him. What's the joke? He's the quietest, most harmless person you've ever met. I'm finished. 
What's for dessert? Oh, Stevie. Meanwhile, Mr. Verloc visits the address he was given by Vladimir, which just so happens to be that of a verb shop. Behind the counter stands the proprietor, who goes by the name of the professor. You remember, the kind old man who makes, hmm, shall we say, fireworks? At the moment, he is getting an earful from a rather unsatisfied customer. <laughs> but I can't understand, madam. This is one of my best songbirds. It's saying all day before you purchased it. Perhaps in uh, another few days it will settle down. Nothing will make it settle down. I've tried everything. Whistling to it, clapping my hands, frying <laughs> bacon. No use. It just sits there and makes me look silly. So that's not the bird's fault, madam, I assure you. <laughs> in there? <laughs> Perhaps it's resting. Have you shot of that, madam? Rest in my eye. I'll have my two and nine, please. And there's your bird back. I want a canary for company. Very well, madam. Here you are. Do come and call us again. We shall see about that. Good day. And how may I help you, sir? Are you the professor? Ah, yes. You want something from my other department. Yes, of course. This way, this way. Let's the professor leads Mr. Verloc into the back room. Let's see what I might have for you in my cupboard. Everything there looks pretty harmless. <laughs> you are right, my friend. But if I were to mix a, a little tomato sauce with some strawberry jam, well, I shouldn't want to be any place near. <laughs> Very clever. Thank you. Now, I gather from our mutual friends that tomorrow is the day and the hour three. But how do I start a mechanism? You leave that to me. By the time you receive it, everything will have been set in motion. You seem a little nervous. Don't be afraid. Say to yourself, there's one man who envies you. Envies me? I have been a fighter always until now. But alas, I'm no longer wanted on the front lines. I must keep the fighter supplied. But... I would rather be in your shoes. I will deliver the package to you tonight. Very well. Good day to you. And you, comrade. Following lunch with Winnie and Stevie, Ted returns to Scotland Yard to update Talbot on his progress. Well, what luck with Mrs. Bell? She knows nothing, sir. Nothing at all. What makes you think so? She has a straight answer to everything. But what about Mr. Verloc? I'm not certain, but if he is mixed up in this, he's certainly not giving himself away. All well, Ted has been following him today. Verloc went to the zoo, evidently by appointment, and met a foreign individual. He then proceeded to a bird shop in Islington. A bird shop in Islington? Doesn't mean much to me either, but Verloc had a lengthy discussion with the proprietor. So we'll keep on the sleep. Very good, sir. Then where is Verloc now? He's returned to the cinema. You can meet Hoyt said there. So, that took you to Simpsons. I mean, a greengrocer can hardly afford a lunch at Simpsons, can he? Of course, I realized he wasn't a greengrocer at all. He's merely a fighter of art, and he's there to learn the business. It's one of a big chain that shop. He told us he's the son of the man who owns them. How would you like a job selling fruit, Stevie? I wouldn't mind. Wouldn't it be grand-tastic? Whenever you like it, I'd have it three times a day. You'd soon get sick of it. Bet I wouldn't. I don't see how I can get sick of things to eat. Except poached eggs. What's the matter with poached eggs? I think they're the worst things in the world. I bet Ted doesn't eat them. I'm sure he does. I bet he doesn't. They're beneath his dignity. He's smart, too and knows all sorts of things. Gangsters and burglars and everything. How does he know? He reads about them. He says gangsters aren't nearly so frightening as you think. Some of them are quite ordinary looking. After all, if gangsters look like gangsters, the police will soon get after them. What are they? Why, good evening, Mrs. Verloc. Hello. Do I know you? 
I'm a business associate of your husband's. Why, hello there. How nice of you to call. Oh, and you must be Stevie. That's right. What's in the package? It's a surprise for you, Stevie. A pair of birds. I just love them. Which one's the hen? Well, you have to wait till one of them lays an egg. Wouldn't it fool everybody if one day the gent laid an egg? Gosh, wouldn't that be funny? Isn't that kind, Stevie? What do you say? Thank you. You're welcome. Now go show them around with your sister, so the professor and I can have a drink. Now, now, in the bottom of the birdcage, which I've just presented to Stevie, is a trap drawer. Inside the drawer is a package already wrapped as a parcel. I've made it up to look like one of your film containers, you know, something you'd be seen with regularly. A stroke of genius on my part, I do think. Yes, yes, very clever. Uh, so I take this film container to Piccadilly Circus tomorrow afternoon. Yes, the mechanism is set and ready to go at 3 p.m. Do us all proud and keep an eye out on the green grocer next door. You mean that? Yes, well you see, the green grocer is really the cover for Detective Sergeant Ted Spencer of Scotland Yard. What? Oh, excuse me. Oh, I was just leaving. Good evening, I'll let myself out. That was kind of you to give Stevie the birds. He just loves them. I was hoping that would be the case. You're terribly good to him. And am I not to you? You're good to him, you're good to me. You know that. Yes, I know. Now listen here, at Simpsons, when you had lunch with Ted, do you remember what he said to you? Did he ask you, ask you any questions about yourself? About, about me? None that I could think of. Why? I think he may be a detective. From Scotland Yard, that's why. What? Oh, Ted? Don't make me laugh. <laughs> laugh as you'd like, but I'm taking this matter seriously. I'm going to have a word with him right now. I just stopped by and he's off this afternoon. He's got eyes for you. I've seen it. Well, now we know why. It's information he's after. Well, then I shall have a word with him myself. Very well. Now listen, my dear. What are you doing tomorrow afternoon? What did you have in mind? A package from Sunny Den. Delivered. Just tell me where. Fine. I'll write it aloud. Oh, wait a moment. I'd forgotten. Renee's out in the country this weekend for her brother's wedding, and you know how busy we are for the Saturday matinees. Perhaps Stevie can make your delivery. Well, if you think so. He'll be happy to. I'll work it all out. As for now, I think a long bubble bath and an early to bed for yours truly. It's a big day tomorrow. It certainly is. The next morning, Ted meets Winnie in the Bijou lobby. Forgive me for busting in like this. We're getting used to it, Ted. I'm afraid of nothing showing at this early hour. I'm sorry, Mrs. Verloc, but I'm here on business. Yes, the business of spying on our family. Mrs. Verloc, there's nothing personal in all this. Isn't there? You had us fooled, all right, trying to make Stevie and me think you were our friend. Do you think I enjoyed it? Listen, I asked to be taken off this job this morning. You can guess why, but it's not as easy as that. In my job, you have to do as you're told. What have you been told? If it's about the man who came here last night, he came here on business about the cinema. That's just it! You've no idea what business they discuss. Whatever it was, I'm sure my husband hasn't done anything wrong. I hope you're right. Why do you say it like that? Because we believe there's something going on here connected with sabotage. That blackout the other night, you remember? Well, my husband hasn't anything to do with sabotage. He told me that night he'd been in on people. That wasn't true. I saw him come back with my own eyes. I don't believe it. You're making things very difficult for me. I'm afraid I've got to ask you lots of questions. I've told you before, he's the most harmless person in the whole world! <laughs> Has that two-reeler gone over to the Canterbury yet? There is plenty of time. I was just wondering, maybe you could take it along now. There's another little job I've been doing at the same time. One of the uh, projector lenses needs repair. The repairman can come right over here and fetch it, so he suggested you leave it in the cloakroom at Piccadilly Circus Station, and he'll pick it up there at 2.30. Got it. I know the place. The cloakroom at the Piccadilly Circus Station. Very well. Uh, the time is the important thing. It must be there by 2.30, so you'd better get along now. Well, there's no hurry. You'll have to walk all the way. Walk? What for? Well, you know you can take film things in public vehicles. Oh, yes, I forgot. And you needn't tell your sister that you're going as far as Piccadilly. You know how she is, always thinking you're arguing to get run over. She didn't worry.
Now hurry up, you might be late. Don't forget, it's got to be there by 2.30 at the latest. Here, take my watch. I've said ahead by five minutes, so you won't be late. I'm going, I'm going. That's a good boy. Hello, Stevie, what have you got there? I'm taking a two-wheeler over to the Canterbury. Bartholomew the Strangler. That sounds a juicy one. Have you seen it? Fourteen times. Must be quite a wrench parting from it. Have you learned all Bartholomew's tricks by now? <laughs> I'm still practicing the fine points. Well, on your way, Bartholomew. So long. Careful of the crossing, Stevie. I can look after myself, can't I? Stevie, is Mr. Murlock in? Yes, I just left him. Goodbye, Stevie. So long. Now, if you don't mind, may I see your husband? Right this way. You see, Mr. Verlock, I couldn't afford to let you in on this. Now I put my cards on the table. I've come here to ask for your help. Nothing more. I see. About that man who was here last night, I've been instructed to get a little information about him. We'd be very grateful if you'd help us. Well, any help I can give, of course. And I have some questions for you as well, Mr. Verlock. When did you first come to this country? Perhaps it would be better if you put it down on paper. Just a formality. At 2.15 on his way to Piccadilly Circus, Stevie found himself distracted by a street salesman. There's always someone in the street ready to steal your time and money. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I want to ask you a question. What is it causes teeth to fall out? Decay is inevitable in all human organisms, but what if I was to tell you that decay can be instantaneously halted? I have here in my hand a tube of the most remarkable preparation, Salvadon! Six, uh, six shillings for a small tube and five shillings for an even smaller tube containing four times as less of the product. Now let me give you just a little demonstration. Uh, I see here a young gentleman who I'm sure would be happy to assist me. Me? No, I wouldn't. Yes, you would. Come on right up here in this chair, young fella. But I... All right, there we are. Don't get excited. I want you to observe, ladies and gentlemen, that the young gentleman's teeth are very dirty. They are not. Yes, they are. Now, come on here. Open your mouth. That's a good boy. Salvador performs the functions that nature forgot. It cleanses the teeth, refreshes the mouth, and removes all traces of halitosis. Halli what? Bad breath to you, sir. Same to you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you'll observe that I have unfortunately disarranged the young gentleman's hair. But that is easily attended to with this bottle of Lawswell. You put it in the hair, like that, you see? It is guaranteed to give you the appearance of patent leather. <laughs> you are now groomed for stardom, as they say. Go on, buzz off, you basket. Go on, what do you want? Go on, cut it! <laughs> the time is the important thing. It must be there by 2.30. And where are you running, young man? I have to make that bus across the square, officer. Nobody's crossing the square, not right now. What's going on here? Don't you see how everyone's lined in the street so nicely? It's a parade, son. A parade? <laughs> oh, oh boy! Wait a minute. I don't have time for a parade. Come here, Alfred. 
Alfred. Oh, he likes you, I can tell. Aw, oh, that's a good boy. Do you have the time? Here, thank my watch. Certainly, it's 2.40. Thank you, son. I beg your pardon, but your wristwatch must have stopped. The time is the important thing. I, I can't be late. Perhaps it needs winding? I have five past three and this pocket watch has never failed me. It must be there by 2.30. Superintendent Talbot, please. Spencer here, sir. What? A whole bus load? No survivors? A whole bus load of people have been blown up in the West End. How awful! I have to go. Spencer, I'm glad you're here. I had no idea to the extent of the damage. I've seen many things in my day, Spencer, but this is one of the most devastating. Have you cottoned on to any clues? Well, a few curiosities have been laid out on this table here. What's this say? Bartholomew something? Bartholomew the Strangler. That's a film tin, isn't it? It is. I thought you said Verloc hadn't been out since morning. He hadn't. Well, you'd best go back there and see if that's one of their films. I'm off to meet Hoenshead at that bird shop. How many? Two, please. Now, Renee, are you certain you haven't seen Stevie all afternoon? I'm sorry, I haven't. How many tickets, please? One, please. Big Bob Sensation! White Extra News! Big Bob Sensation! He's all right. You've got, he can take care of himself. You've got nothing to worry about. How many? Two, please. White Extra News! Big Bob Sensation! Big Bob Sensation! Give me a sixpence, Renee. Wait, extra news! Big Bob Sensation! Why, I'll take one. There you go, Mom! Wait, extra news! Big Bob Sensation! Explosion. Among remains. Filmton. Bartholomew the Strangler. Look, the lady's fainted! Mrs. Oh. B, oh dear! Help her up, will you? Here you go, ma'am. Up you are. I want Mr. Verloc. I want to see Mr. Verloc. I didn't mean any harm done to the boy, Winnie. I know how you feel. You'll have to pull yourself together. Do you think that I fixed it so that he'd be killed? No! But I tell you who did. Your Scotland Yard friend from next door. Dead! Blame him! I'd have carried the thing myself, but he was hanging around, watching, spying. I, I couldn't get away. Would you rather have lost me? Where are you going? Don't touch me. something to eat. Look at the mess you've made. I'll clean up. No, I will. I started chopping the salad. If you... I'll do it. Hand me that knife. <sighs> That's better. Listen, it's done now. What's done can't be undone. You go to bed after supper, and there's the future. We've got to think of tomorrow. You'll need all your wits about you if they get on to you. Perhaps, I don't know, if we 
had a baby of her own. I'm sorry for so much. A world going under, a world going up in smoke. And Stevie, poor Stevie. I'm sorry. Stevie, poor Stevie. Stevie, poor Stevie. Ah! Sorry, I don't know what to say. You know I'm here. Yes. I have to arrest him. Yes. I'll help him if I can, of course, for your sake, if not for his. I'd do anything for you. You know that, don't you? It's very good of you, Ted, but there isn't anything you can do for either of us. Things aren't as bad as that. The evidence is against him, I admit, but nothing's going to happen to you. I know this isn't a very good time to tell you. I shouldn't tell you at all, I suppose. But before I take him along, I want you to know that what happens to you means a lot to me. I didn't want to tell you how I felt about you, but there it is. I guess I'd better get to my coat if we're going. I can't stop shivering, it's just inside. For God's sake, what happened? He was responsible. I'm responsible. It's all over done with. Now we must go. Go where? To the police, of course. Beep! No, hold on. Wait a minute. Listen to me. You can't go through this. You're not guilty. I know it was an accident. Anyway, you only did the hangman's job for him. I know the facts, but no one else does. What chance would you stand for judge and jury? It doesn't matter. You're telling me you've nothing left to live for. Is that it? Look at me. Put your arms around me. <laughs> Ted! We're going to get out of all this. No good. I don't see how. Will anyone try and get in that room? Mrs. Jones comes in at 8 in the morning. And you say we've got no chance. We've got 12 hours before anyone will find him. Ted! Oh, what? Uh, Hello, Harling, Ted. Inspector Talbot is coming from the yard. That man from the bird shop, the professor, is on his way here in a taxi to arrest him and Verloc on arrival. Good work. Go see the woman in the box office. Her name is Renee, and she'll show you in. Are you coming, Ted? In a minute. There's the Birdman and the taxi now. Then you better hurry, had it. And Talbot's right behind you. I'll be there in a minute. Right here, Ted. Now's our chance. You mustn't look as though you've been crying. Come along. As Ted attempts to lead Winnie to the underground station, Hollings head follows the professor through the cinema into the door of the Burlock home. <laughs> Mr. Burlock. Mr. Burlock, congratulations on your work this afternoon. Mr. Burlock, it's the professor. Are you home? Put your hands where I can see him! Oh dear, Scotland Yard. <laughs> you may see my hands. See them? What do you see but I'm holding in this one? Once I let go of this button, Bell, I'm warning you, my friend. You'd better be far away. Dear God, I've got to get the audience out of the cinema!
roof's gone. The whole back of the place is blown out. Most of the audience had been cleared, thank goodness, but Burdock. You know I saw some things in the wall, but... Is there enough left to identify? I wouldn't say so, sir. <laughs> You'd better go look after Mrs. Verloc. Her husband's dead, alone to glory. You can break it to her. There'll be a few inquiries later, but there's nothing against her, as far as I can tell. Yes, sir. I'm going to see her to the train station. Yes, you do that. And thank her for all her help. Of course. Good night. Good night. That's queer. Is that girl psychic? She said that Verloc was dead, but did she say it before? Or was it after? I can't remember. Oh, Mrs. Verloc! Mrs. Verloc! Well, would you look at them scurrying away? Now that's what I call a lady vanishing. Undoubtedly <laughs> never to be seen again in these parts, I suppose. <laughs> Let them tell, but... I'm coming, I'm coming! And now, if you don't mind, I shall stay to disappearance of my own. But don't be alarmed, I see it is time for our intermission. You may leave your seats if you wish and have some light refreshments, chat with your friends. But please hurry back for our next play, for when I reappear in 15 minutes, it'll be to tell you the third of a little trio of fairy stories for grown-up children. <laughs> that will fit in here nicely. Mother would say is second to none. 
The Bates Motel is truly an experience you will treasure for the rest of your days. Just call for prompt teletype reservations. <laughs> Jolly little trio of tales begins with a murder, and then things get very serious and the danger begins. Now, before you get the wrong idea, let me make one thing clear. I abhor violence. That is why when we use stabbing, shooting, or garroting on this program, we only use it when it is absolutely essential to the plot. <laughs> or when the wind strikes. <laughs> This play is entitled The 39 Steps and takes place in a music hall. That's all I intend to tell you. You will have to figure out the rest yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, with your kind attention and permission, I now have the honor of presenting to you one of the most remarkable men in the world. I present Mr. Memory. Every day we give us to memory 50 new books, 50 ladies and gentlemen. Books from history, geography, newspapers, and scientific books. Millions and millions of them. And he remembers them all. Test him, ladies and gentlemen, test him. Ask him any question you like, and he will answer you fully and freely. Mr. Memory. Thank you, thank you. A question, please. A question from anyone in the audience. Ladies first. Where's my old man been since last Saturday? On the booze! <laughs> a serious question, please. What won the Derby in 1921? That was Mr. Jack Jewell's humorist with Steve Donahue up, one by a length. Odd six to one, second and third, Craig and Aaron, and Lemonor, am I right, sir? Right! <laughs> Thank you very much. Question, please. Do not hesitate. Another question, please. Mr. Mary, what's up? How do you know who is the British heavyweight champion of the world? Henry VIII. <laughs> My old <laughs> boy! <laughs> Actually, it was Bob Fitzsimmons. He defeated Jim Corbett, heavyweight champion of America, at Carson City, Nevada, in October 1897. He was then 34 years of age. Am I right, sir? Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. 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 Why you can't ask him those silly questions? <laughs> How far is Winnipeg from Montreal? Miss Winnie who, sir? How far is Winnipeg from Montreal? Ah, a gentleman from Canada. Canada. You're welcome, sir. Winnipeg, the third city of Canada and the capital of Manitoba, distance from Montreal, 1,710 miles. Am I right, sir? Quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're right. Yes, I think so. I had to get out of that theater, that's all. A lot of people had that idea. Oh, it wasn't the panic that frightened me. It was something else. I'm afraid I don't understand. I... Oh, I'm in terrible trouble. Will you help me? What kind of trouble? I, I can't tell you here. Can we go someplace and talk? Well, my flat is nearby. May I come home with you? Well, it's your funeral. Come on, there's a bus. <laughs> Thank you. Now, if I can find this light switch... Oh, no! Don't turn on the lights. It will be safer. Hmm. Very well. Uh, will you pull down the blinds, please? Sure. Very well. This just puts me doubly in the dark. My name's Richard Hannon. Any objections to telling me yours? No, it's Smith. Annabella Smith. Smith? Really? Is there anything wrong with it? No, it's just an... Unusual name. Do you want to know more about me? What do you think I do for a living? Actress. <laughs> not in the way you mean. Of course. Uh, certainly not. I'm a freelance. No, for adventure, eh? That's right. Oh, don't answer the telephone. Why not? Because I think it's for me. Please, don't answer. Say, 
What's this all about? You said you were in trouble. You don't believe me, do you? I believe you're slightly hysterical. If I am, I have good reason. I was the one who fired those shots in that theater tonight. You? Why? To create a diversion. I had to get away from that theater quickly. There were two men there who wanted to kill me. <laughs> you should be more careful in choosing your gentlemen friends. You don't. You've got to believe me. Why should anyone want to kill you? You wouldn't understand. Well, you're not making it easy for me. A beautiful, mysterious woman pursued by gunmen. Sounds like a spy story. That's exactly what it is. Only, I prefer the word agent. Agent? For what country? Any country that pays me. What is your country? I have no country. Born in a balloon? I suppose you come here to dig up some great big state secret. <coughs> no, I'm here to save a secret. A very important secret for this country. Not because I love England, but because it will pay me better. The very brilliant agent of a certain foreign power is on the point of obtaining a secret vital to your air defense. I tracked two of his men to that music hall. Unfortunately, they recognized me. That's why they're after me now. You have heard of a thing called persecution mania? You don't believe me. Frankly, I don't, Annabella. Very well. If you will go and look out of that window, you will see two men standing across the street. I hope that's shaking them off. Look. Please do. All right, I'll play a game a bit further. Oh, don't let them see you. Well? By Jove, you're right. Two of them. They seem to be looking up here. Come away from the window, please. Do you believe me now? I suppose I must. I'm going to tell you something which is not very healthy to know. But now that they have followed me here, you are in it as much as I am. So it seems. Have you ever heard of the 39 Steps? <laughs> no. What's that, a pub? Never mind. <laughs> but this much you must know. What you were laughing at is true. These men are ruthless, and I'm the only person who can stop them. If they're not stopped, it is only a matter of days, perhaps hours, before the secret is out of the country. Why don't you phone the police? Because they wouldn't believe me any more than you did. And if they did believe me, how long do you think it would take to get them going? These men act quickly. You don't know how clever the chief is. Clever and merciless. What's his name? The chief goes by a dozen names and can look like a hundred people. But there's one thing he cannot disguise. The top part of the little finger on his right hand is missing. If ever you should meet a man with no top joints there, well, be very careful, my friend. Thanks. I'll make a note of it. Meanwhile, what are you going to do? <sighs> I'm frightened. Oh, you needn't to be. What you need is a good night's rest. Oh, yes, I do. You're welcome to my bed. I'll get a shakedown on the couch. Are you sure you don't mind? I'm sleeping on the couch? Well, I've done it a dozen times. Uh, no, I mean being in danger. Oh, I'm not quite convinced of that yet. Now, is there anything I can get to you? Yes. Have you a map of Scotland, please? A oh, map of Scotland? I have an atlas over here somewhere. If only I can find... Oh, yes! Here it is. You're going deer stalking or just plain hiking? There's a man in Scotland whom I must visit next if anything is to be done. I see. Are there 39 steps in Scotland by any chance? Perhaps I'll tell you tomorrow. Good night, Mr. Hanny. Hmm. Good night, Annabella. Pleasant dreams. Two 
o'clock at Windsor. I don't know. Let's get a paper. Paper, please, the dispatch. What one? Bachelor Bud, seven to four wards. Good. Not so good. Hello, look at this. Woman murdered in Western Club. These sex dramas don't appeal to me. Portland Mansions, Portland Place. By the BBC. That's a nice quiet place to put someone to sleep. What was she like? One of the usual? Another tipsy blonde? A well-dressed woman of about 25 found with a knife in her back. Lieutenant Richard Hanny is missing. The police are hot on the trail and watching with careful eye all points of departure from London. So that was what they were doing, eh? Who? Scotland Yard. Those bobbies. I've seen them get on the train. Ask them plenty of questions, they would too. Looky here, there's a picture of that honey chap. Let's have a squint at him. Rough looking lot, ain't he? Excuse me. Say, young fella, where are you going? Don't you like that, Steve? Oh, I do, thank you, but I just remembered something. In a bit of a hurry, wasn't it? Excuse me, miss, but I have to do this. <gasps> Nothing in here, Chief, except the man grabbing a bit. <laughs> Let's go down the end of the double back. I'm not accustomed to strange men barging in my compartment, let alone kissing me. I assure you, miss, that I'm no stranger than most, and kissing you is my way of hiding, not introducing myself. But I'm afraid that they'll be back and, well, I might be compelled to do it again. Really? Well, I'm not interested. Now, will you please go? I can't. What? Why not? It isn't safe. Listen to me. Are you going? Or should I have to call a conductor? Oh, no, don't do that. I just want your help. You see, my name is Richard Hanny. Hanny? Why, you're the man the police are looking for. Yes, but I'm innocent, I swear. Listen, you've got to help me. It's terribly important that I be free for the next few days. You will help me, won't you? Yes, of course I will. That's fine. You say the police are on this train looking for you. Yes, that's why I forced my way in here. And just how am I supposed to help you? They're looking for a man traveling alone. If I stay here with you, they'll think we're together and just pass us by. How clever you are. You'll do it? Yes, of course. <laughs> say, you're all right. What's your name? I'm Pamela Stewart. Pamela, that's rather pretty. It suits you. Thank you. There they are now. Remember, I'll sit here and pretend to read. You do the talking. All right. Come in. Excuse me, have either of you seen a man pass here in the last few minutes? Young fellow, smooth shaven. Why, no. Wait, are you the police? That's right, miss. This is the man you want! He bars his way in here and told me his name was Richard Hanny! Why? Come here, you! Let go of me! Are you Richard Hanny? Well, speak up! Yes, and thank you very much, Miss Stewart. Well, you didn't expect me to harbor a murderer, did you? I am not a murderer, and I hoped you might give me the chance to prove that. We'll see about that. Come on, Hanny. Certainly, gentlemen. I'll go with you willingly. In fact, I'll lead the way. Grab him! <laughs> Open that door! He's holding it from the other side! Here, let me try! Together now! One, two, three! Where is he? Where he goes! There he is! He's done that last way! The man here, stop! Stop! Have you got him? Oh. He jumped! He jumped off the train! Well, he's probably lying dead in a ditch. No, the last I saw of him, he was on his two feet and running like a rabbit. On his skates! Paper! I need skates! Paper! Extra special! I need skates from police! Paper! Extra extra! Paper! Two days have passed, and Richard Hanny, wanted for a murder he did not commit, is still at large. Determined to discover the secret of the 39 steps, he's made his way to Scotland. A driver of a donkey cart is giving him a lift, and he is now on the last leg of the journey. The outskirts of the village of Ot Notchalock. <laughs> Are you gonna stay long and out not so long, laddie? Well, that all depends. I'm looking for work. Suppose I could find something. I have my doubts, laddie. Oh, not so long is a mighty small village. It... What do you do? Uh, I'm a chauffeur. Well, I'd figure you better try somewhere else then. Oh, I see. But aren't there any newcomers who might need a chauffeur? Ah, uh, yeah, wait a minute. I come to think of it, I did hear something about a retired professor who lives in a big house on the edge of the Mars. Huh. A professor? That's it. I can try it anyhow. Yes, sir? I'd like to see the master, please. And what name should I say, sir? He wouldn't know my name. You might ask him if he knows a Miss Annabella Smith. Yes, sir. Is that someone for me, George? Uh, yes, Professor. How do you do? How do you do? My name is Hannah. 
Hammond, I've come from London, from Annabella Smith. Oh! Well, do come in, please. You must be tired. We can talk in the library. Oh, yes, of course. Go right in, please. <laughs> thank you. Sit down. Will you have a drink? No, thank you. Well, now, what did you want to see me about, Mr. Hanny? Hanny? You know me? Yes. I suppose it's safe to call you by your right name now. What about our mutual friend, Annabella? She's been murdered. I know, poor girl. The police are looking for you. Yes, but I didn't do it. Oh, of course you didn't. But why come all this way to Scotland to tell me about it? I believe she hoped to come and see you about some Air Ministry secret. She was killed by a foreign agent who was trying to steal it. Did she tell you what this foreign agent looked like? Only one thing. She told me that the top of his little finger was missing. On which hand, Mr. Henning? On the left, I believe. Oh, are you sure it wasn't on the right? It might have been. Like on my hand, Mr. Henning! <laughs> it's you! You're the one she- The one she was trying to warn you against. The chief! <laughs> you misunderstood her! She meant for you to kill me, not to bring me information. Well, what are we going to do about it? Ah, that's just the point. What are we going to do? You see, I live here as a respectable citizen. It would, you must realize that my whole existence would be jeopardized if it became known that I'm not what I seem. You understand my position? Yes, quite. Mr. Henny, why have you come here? Why have you forced me into this difficult position? I can't lock you up in a room or anything like that. There's my wife and daughters to think of. And what makes it doubly important that I shouldn't let you go is that I'm just about to transfer some very vital information out of this country. What? Oh yes, I've got it already. I'm afraid for Annabella would have been too late in any case. Well, that's that, I suppose. If only it were that simple. But it seems to me we have some unfinished business to and attend. What's that? I have a small revolver here. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Suppose I left you alone with this? Tomorrow's newspapers could then announce that the Portland Place murderer had taken his own life. You want me to kill myself? You're mad! I won't do it! <laughs> then I'm afraid you've left me no alternative. <laughs> you should have stayed in London, my friend. <laughs> oh, George! George! Yes, Professor. I want your help, please. There's a little job for us in summer. We'll carry Henny to the garage, and when it gets dark, you can drop him off on the road somewhere. Where is he, sir? Uh, behind that table. Here, sir. Yes, pick him up. I'm and... sorry, sir, but there's no one here. What? You can see for yourself. Uh, why I shot him? The body was lying there on the floor. The body, sir, seems to have disappeared. <laughs> I just wanted a lift. Would you mind? Well, Miss Stewart, how do you do? You? What are you doing here? Richard Hanny is my name. I believe we met. On a train, wasn't it? Yes, I think so. And if I remember correctly, you handed me over to the police, didn't you? Oh, get away from me. Oh, don't worry. I won't hold it against you. That's very kind of you. What are you doing in Alt National? I live here. It's a charming place, isn't it? Do you know where the local police station is? Of course I do. Well, take me there and hurry, please. Well, I suppose you know what you're doing. Oh, yes. You see, I know who killed Annabella Smith. Is that so? The same man who shot me a few minutes ago. Shot you? Where? Right in the cigarette case. See? This hole on one side of it. Funny little things. Cigarette cases. If I had been carrying about in my breast pockets, the hole would have been right to my chest. And to think of it, only last week, I was trying to quit. <laughs> <laughs> Just who was this arch villain? A gentleman called the Professor. Oh, you don't mean Professor Bartlett? I didn't stop to inquire his last name. <laughs> Come on, it isn't as funny as all that. Do you actually mean to go into the police with the story? That Professor Bartlett shot you? That he's the one who killed the woman you're accused of killing? Of course. Why not? And you expect them to believe it, I suppose? Well, you don't, evidently. No, and neither will they. Professor Bartlett, a murderer. Why, he's one of the best-liked men in the village, and a very good friend of the sheriff's. I'm sure the sheriff will be interested in your story. <laughs> yes, I see your point. It hadn't occurred to me that... Stop the car, I'm getting out. Oh, no, you're not. 
You said you wanted to go to the police. Well, that's just where you're going. And if you touch me or make a move to jump out, I'll turn this car into a ditch. Well, aren't you the sweet little thing? Now you just sit tight, Mr. Hanny, and don't make any sudden gestures. You're going rather fast. You have it the nerve, of course. Haven't I? Just try me. All right, I will. Uh, don't touch that brake! <laughs> Hang on! <laughs> There's a dangerous conspiracy against this country, and I'm the only man who can stop it. <laughs> they were taking us to their boss, and God help us if they ever catch us again. I see. You're still sticking to your penny and dreadful spy story. Oh, all right then. Very well. I'm just a plain common murderer who stabbed an innocent, defenseless woman in Portland Place, London. I don't know how innocent you may be, but you're a woman. You're defenseless, and manacled to a murderer on a desolate morn would stop at nothing to get you off his hands. If that's the situation you prefer, then have it, my lovely, and welcome. Well, I'm not afraid of you. Why not? For all you know, I may murder a woman a week. So listen to a bit of advice. Do everything I tell you to do, and do it quick. You big bully! <laughs> Gazoo tight. I like your pluck, but you keep a civil tongue in your head. Otherwise, I might feel my next killing was a little a bit overdue. All right, on your feet now. Where are we going? I see some lights over that way. We'll do a little investigating. What kind of a place do you think this is? Well, I don't know. It looks like an inn. Now remember to back me up on everything I say or do. Do you understand? Yes. Now stay close to me and hold my hand. It'll hide the handcuffs. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to King's Head Tavern. And what can I do for you and the lady? We had an accident with our car a few miles back. Oh, that's too bad now. You want to stay the night, I suppose? Yes, we do. Will it be two separate rooms or one? Two one separate room, please. <laughs> one. Wait, which? One, thank you. And what's the name? Um, Hawkinson. Hawkinson, Henry Hawkinson and Mrs. Hawkinson. Well, come along, Mr. and Mrs. Hawkinson. The room is at the top of the landing. 
Hmm. Nice place you have here. Thank you. Here's the room. Thanks very much. Well, good night to you. Oh, wait, please, you mustn't go. What's the matter? Is there anything wrong? Yes, Of well, course there's nothing wrong. She just wants to tell you something, that's yes, all. You yes, see, I... we're a runaway couple. Oh, are you now? Yes, as a matter of fact, we've been running all night. If anyone inquires for us, you won't give us away, will you? Oh, of course not. I was young myself once. <laughs> uh, good night. Good night. <laughs> I'm sorry, Pamela. Of all the outrageous things! Listen, you don't expect I'm going to sit, spend the night in this room with you? Personally, I don't see how you can help yourself. I didn't ask to come with you! And I didn't invite you, but here we are. But well, aren't you afraid the men will find us? I'm not thinking of that so much as a way to get out of these handcuffs. Oh, I have a mail file in my pocket. Maybe that'll help. Hmm, that would be dandy. If you file 24 hours a day, 10 years from now we might be free. Imagine tied to you for 10 years. <laughs> That's a horrible thought. I don't have enough of your insults! I'm going to tell the innkeeper the whole story! You want me to hang for a murder I didn't commit? As long as you hang, I don't care whether you committed it or not! What a bloodthirsty creature you are! Haven't you any pity? No. <laughs> Ow! What are you up to now? I'm trying to file the handcuffs. Well, don't jab me in the wrist that way. I don't like it. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. You're going about it in a very amateurish fashion anyway. I can see you know nothing about filing handcuffs. At least I'm trying to do something. Well, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to try to get some sleep. I haven't got a wink for 48 hours. Well, I'm not in the least bit tired. You don't mind if I stretch out in this chair, do you? Not at all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. But I don't see how you can sleep at a time like this. <laughs> Watch me. It's your imagination. It was not my imagination. I heard a car. Well, all right. If you don't care. I don't care. I just don't care. It's early the following morning. Richard Hanny stirs restlessly in his armchair, rubbing his sleepy eyes. Suddenly, he jumps up from his chair, staring down at the handcuffs, now dangling from his wrist. Pamela Stewart has freed herself and sits across the room. Good morning, Mr. Hawkinson. How did you get free? Oh, very simple. A little work while you had your beauty sleep. I suppose you filed the handcuffs? No, I picked the lock. I was trying to do the same for you, but the file broke. Say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you being so nice? You don't feel ill or anything, do you? No, why should I? Why didn't you leave? You were very anxious to last night, if I remember correctly. <coughs> well, something happened last night that convinced me that you had been telling the truth. When I got free, I went downstairs. That car you said I imagined belonged to our pursuers. They were sitting downstairs when I got there. Did they see you? No, I hid behind the counter. They asked the innkeeper about us. What did she say? She said she hadn't seen us. <coughs> then they ordered something to eat. And while they were eating, they talked a lot about... Uh, about the 39 steps. The 39 steps? And don't ask me what it means, because I don't know. But they said the professor was clearing out of the country. Then he has got the secrets. Did they say how soon they were leaving? No, but they did say he was going to London to pick up someone at a music hall. 39 steps. London music hall? It doesn't make any sense. Which room are these men in? <sighs> oh, they left about four or five hours ago. What? You let them go after hearing what they said? Four or five precious hours wasted. Oh, you bun-headed little idiot! Don't you speak to me like that! My dear girl, I'm accused of murder, and the only way I can stop and this stop is I have to expose this body! Then why don't you go to Scotland Yard? What's the use? You said so yourself, they wouldn't be leaving. You, well, then why don't I go to Scotland Yard? Why not? They'd listen to you. Of course they would. Come on, we'll get the next train for London. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone. I beg your pardon, sir, but my face looks familiar. Are you someone famous? No, I'm not. Bring me a bottle of ale, will you? Very good. Then make that to you, please. Yes, miss. Pamela, sit down. What's happened? Did you go to Scotland Yard? Yes, and prepare yourself for a shock. They checked every possible channel, but the Air Ministry is positive there are no papers missing that would be of any possible interest to spies. That's incredible. Are you sure? Well, that's exactly what they said. Well, I don't know what to make of it. I think you've been tricked. No, it certainly is very bewildering. I'm sorry, Richard. Really, I am. Look, I think you'd better go now. Go where? Any place. 
Leave the country. I'll help you. Oh, I know it sounds funny, but I somehow couldn't bear the thought of them catching me again. Why, Pamela! I guess I just changed my mind about you. That's all. Uh, I suppose you're as vain as a peacock and I couldn't stand you for any length of time. But you're something else. Well, you know what to find what's in this gem. I... What? Nothing. <laughs> What's that to you whistling? Oh, that silly one of yours. He <laughs> must have picked it up. Wait a minute. Pamela, you're brilliant. Me? What did I do? That's you. Now I remember where I put it before. And now I remember where we must go. Where? Follow me. Woo! <laughs> Here are your seats, sir. First two on the aisle. Thank you. Sit down, Pamela. The show's almost over. Just be quiet. I'm playing a hunch. That's all. Ladies and gentlemen, with your kind permission and attention, I now have the honor to present to you one of the most remarkable men in the world. I present Mr. Memory. Mr. Mr. Memory! Oh, no. No. Look in that box to the right of the stage. You see that tall man sitting in front? It's the professor himself. You've got to get out of here before they see you. No, sit down. Listen. Every day he commits to memory 50 new facts and he remembers every one of them. Facts from history, from geography, from newspapers and scientific books. Come on, I've got it, I've got it. You got what? Of course there are no papers missing. All the information's inside Mr. Memory's head. I still don't understand. Don't you see? The details of that Air Ministry secret were borrowed and memorized by this man and then replaced before anyone could find out. That's why the professor's here. To take Mr. Memory out of the country after the show. But there's a gentleman that would like to speak with you. Me. Yes. Are you Richard Hammond? Well, I. Uh, You're under arrest. Wait, officer, look. There's something here you ought to know. Come along quietly. Look at that man on the stage. Don't cause any trouble and spoil people's entertainment. A question, please. Do not hesitate. Wait a minute, Mr. Memory. What are the 39 steps? Come on, answer up. What are the 39 steps? The 39 Steps is an organization of spies working on behalf of the foreign officers of. He's a spy! Everything you hear. Now, listen here. I don't know where. And do as he tells you, please. I'm going to prove to you that the man who shot Mr. Memory is the same who murdered the woman I'm accused of killing. What is it? We want to see Mr. Memory. How is he, Doctor? Pretty bad. Did they get the man who shot him? We got him, all right. What's this all about? Oh. Mr. Memory, can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Memory, there's something I'd like you to tell us, please. Yes. What was the secret formula you were taking abroad? Would it be all right me telling you, sir? It was a big job to learn it, the biggest I ever tackled, and I don't want to throw it all away. It'll be quite all right. The first feature of the new engine is its greatly increased ratio of compression, represented by R minus over R to the power of gamma, where R represents the ratio of compression and gamma. Seen in end elevation, the axis of two lines of cylinders, this device renders the engine completely silent. Am I right, sir? Quite right, old chap. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad it's off my mind at last. This way, please, so we can pick up the police car on the corner. The police car? Where are you taking us? To Scotland Yard, of course. Scotland Yard? No, but you can't do that. You heard what the man said. He didn't kill anybody. Easy now, easy. He'll be all right. All we want to do is put his story on the record. Oh. Oh, that's better. Nothing to worry about at all. He'll be a free man in an hour, Mrs. Hattie. Mrs. Hattie? What's he talking about? <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm sorry. Mrs. I got him. They'd be just fine, that would. We were together for one day and fought 24 hours. 20? You were asleep four hours. Could you imagine what it would be like? Fight for breakfast, fight for lunch, fight for dinner. <laughs> one long, drawn out battle for the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, 40 years? Do you think we could even keep it up that long? I mean, really. Well, we could try. <laughs> You'll be released.
relieved to hear that Pamela and Hani's story ended happily. They did not get married. <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes WBFR Playhouse of the Air's presentation of Vintage Hitchcock, our offering for tonight. But I have not reached the end of my rope. Next week you will hear from me again without a shadow of a doubt. Put your suspicions to rest and join us each and every week for what I assure you will be something rich, rich and strange that will leave you spellbound. <laughs> Until next time, good evening. <laughs> <laughs>